And as usual, please don't take any screenshots, recordings, or photos of the call without the express permission of the AGJC. And with that out of the way, AB, over to you to kick us off. Uh, hi, everybody. Bismillah ar-Rahman rahim Welcome to the AGJC's weekly Shabbat Resume. Uh, each week we gather together the Jewish communities of all six GCC countries and our families and friends from around the world to hear an inspirational message before Shabbat, light candles, hear a Dvar Torah from our rabbis, pray and read a section from the weekly Torah portion. The Association of Gulf Jewish Communities is the umbrella organization for the Jewish communities of the GCC countries that are building and enhancing Jewish life in the region. While each community is independent, we share a common goal and vision for Jewish life to flourish in the Gulf for the benefit of both residents and visitors. And I understand we have some very interesting guests today. So without further ado, thank you, Jim. Thank you, Amy, for that introduction. And now to light Shabbat candles, we have Jennifer, aka my mum. And I know she's very excited. So over to you. Thank you, Jake. Thank you. Um, before I light, I'd just like to say we were so fortunate to have been able to visit Jake in Dubai earlier this year. We had a wonderful trip and the highlight was seeing the vibrant and varied Jewish community really thriving there. So we hope that all of the Gulf communities continue to go from strength to strength. Now I will light the candles. Good Shabbos, everyone. Amen. Thanks, Mum. It's uh, been a while since I've actually seen you light the candles uh, in person, oh. certainly. So it's nice to uh, do it with you online this week. Oh, lovely. And with you, Didna Fesh, over to Isaac. Yedi <laughs> Vecholta madurna e zifa olam nav shikola ahavatecha anael narefana la beharodla no amaziva has did hazek vetitra pe behaitala. Shifcha tolam avatik yehemuna Rachamecha vechusana Al benahu vecha Ki ze kama nichsov nichsavti Lirod vetiferet uzecha Ana eli machmad libi Hushana ve altitalam Higalena ufros havivalai Et sukat shelomecha Tairerets mikvodecha Nagila venismecha bach Maherahub kivaha moed Thanks, Isaac. Uh, Alex will sing Le Chadodi for us. Le Chadodi li katka la pene shabat ne kabela le Chadodi li katka la pene shabat ne kabela shamo vezacho bedi bo vechadish mi anu ela 
Alex and to introduce our guest speaker this week now we're going to turn to Ariella. Ariella. Thanks so much Jake. Eric Rubin is the president of Uncommon Portfolio Design, an SEC registered investment advisor which manages donor advisor funds, uh, assets rather, for Uncommon Charitable Impact and Uncommon ETFs. Uncommon Portfolio Design is also the owner of the Uncommon Generosity 50 Equity Index, a unique index that tracks the price of return of the 50 highest ranked stocks from when, within the S&P 500 index selected based on corporate generosity. The corporate generosity ranking is calculated by assessing generosity across several different categories. I'm sure I'll talk to us about that today. The goal is to identify the best examples of companies acting as good corporate citizens and giving back to a variety of stakeholders. Eric is a board member of many, many nonprofits. But I think for all of us today, he's really, truly a friend of ours from overseas uh, back in the States. We had a chance to welcome him to Dubai, and we hope we'll see him here in Bahrain soon as well. So without further ado, Eric. Thank you, Ariella, for the, for the warm welcome. And, and thank you to everyone at the AEGJC for having me today. Um, I'm going to uh, share my screen, Jake. So if you could give me permission, I'd appreciate it. Yep, you should be able to do that now. Okay. Okay, can everybody see my presentation? Yes? Okay, great. So um, I spend a lot of time uh, traveling around the country, speaking to financial advisors about philanthropy. And so when I was how I wanted to address this to you, and I got from Brett was sitting, uh, and I started opening up, and this is what it looked like. I opened my first piece of mail from the Western Wall Heritage Foundation. I started opening my next piece. Magen David Adom, not it's a presentation. Uh, 
Hi everyone, it seems there's some technical difficulties on Eric's side, so we'll give him just a minute and I'm sure he'll be back up very shortly. Jay, can you, are you guys going to hear me? Maybe shut his camera, that will help. Eric, you seem to be back now. We lost you for a second, but- Okay, uh, sorry. Can you guys see my screen? Yeah, we can see your screen. So what I was saying, I'm sorry if you didn't hear me, is I got home from a trip and I started opening my mail. Uh, and this is what was in front of me. And what I realized is that there are still a, a lot of nonprofits that don't realize that this is not how you appeal to the Gen Z and millennials. Okay, my son is 27 years old. And I can tell you when he comes home and sees this, this does not inspire him to give. And quite the contrary, what a lot of millennials and Gen Z find is, is this is alienating that group because they see this as a waste, a waste of paper, killing trees, um, and not the way to solicit uh, the younger generations for charitable giving. And so we need to figure out how do we bridge the great generation, the baby boomers, the traditionalists, um, and nonprofits appeal to the younger generation. So that's one of the issues that, we, that, that nonprofits are, are stuck trying to face. Um, what I want to show you uh, a little bit on the Uncommon Giving Portal. But first, I wanted you guys to, to show this statistic because a lot of people think that uh, millennials and Gen Z don't give. But this was an inst interesting statistic that we found about what happened uh, since COVID. And what this shows you is that nearly 75% of millennials provided financial support to family, friends, or nonprofits since the COVID-19 pandemic began. And I think this is an important statistic because if you notice provided financial support, including the family and friends, the millennials and Gen Z generation care less about whether or not something is tax deductible. They are more interested in giving to their local communities and supporting it than they worry about the tax deductibility, which is definitely something different uh, from previous generations. And here's, I thought was a great quote, the spirit of generosity and passion for impact among younger donors is awe-inspiring. The younger generation is giving to more local uh, communities, things that they're involved with in their town. They are not large supporters of organizations like the Salvation Army, Red Cross, United Way. I'm not saying they don't give to those organizations, but what I am saying is, they care a lot more about their local communities. I don't know if anyone can guess in 2020 what the number one Googled um, nonprofit related item was. And uh, if you don't imagine, it, it was hurricanes. The younger generations are most more, much more concerned about climate related issues, about social justice issues. Um, so believe it or not, hurricanes was the most Googled topic when it came to philanthropy for the younger generations. So I'm gonna skip this for- Shalom from Jerusalem, everybody. I'm gonna come back to that video. What I wanna do now is quickly show you uh, a little bit about what the Uncommon Giving Portal looks like um, and what we're trying to do. So when you come to our website, you can search nonprofits by any way. So if you want, we give you some samples of uh, categories that you could search on, or you could type in whatever you're passionate about, coexistence, social justice, hurricanes, uh, climate change. I'm gonna click here on health and wellness. And what we do is we always give you a nonprofit that we highlight. Um, here's Give and Grow Basketball, which is based in the Baltimore community. And when you click on their profile, what you'll notice about our website is that it is very heavy in video content and photos. And that was done intentionally. Sorry, that was done intentionally because millennials and Gen Z care quite a bit about being able to see and hear 
what's going on. So let me see if this will play. Thank you, Human Girl Basketball. I really appreciate you guys for helping me no longer feel lonely. That was Van, and I'm Coach Ben, founder of Giving Girl Basketball. I'm here to show you how we've been elevating youth mental, emotional, and physical health amidst the pandemic. We combine the fundamentals of mental health such as mindfulness, emotion management, and breath work with basketball to meet kids like Van where they're already inspired. Throughout the pandemic, we've impacted thousands of K-5 graders virtually in partnerships with schools and NBA teams across the country. Now we need your help to continue making that impact. We're launching a revolutionary program, one that's never been done before, and we're calling it so, I don't want to go through the whole video, but I wanted you guys to get a sense for is um, how we are now marketing to the younger generation of givers. Um, they care about videos, they care about local community, as I mentioned, and they want to see the impact you have. One of the other things that we do um, that is quite different from um, most other nonprofits, as well as most on other uh, platforms that show that is you're probably all very um, used to, if you make a charitable donation, getting a letter in the mail or an email. Again, to appeal to the different generations, what we do is instead of sending you a letter or an email, and yes, you will get an email saying, thank you for your tax deductible donation, and, and, and here's where it went to. But as opposed to sending a thank you letter, um, after someone makes in a donation on the portal, they actually get a thank you video. So what I wanted to just do is, um, some of you probably recognize our, our dear friend, Justine. Um, that's Avi Solomon, who ran in the Abu Dhabi Marathon. And after people made donations to support Avi's run, as well as um, the nonprofit he ran for, you immediately saw this video. Shalom from Jerusalem, everybody. We'd just like to thank you so much from the Uncommon Giving platform that you've supported Avi to make his dream come true in Abu Dhabi and Afikim. Avi. I, I have to say thank you. You helped me and Afikim. Uh, see you in uh, Abu Dhabi. Thank you for your support. You. Lots of love. Thank you. Thank you. So hopefully what you guys can all get a feel for is how we're trying to uh, appeal to a different generation um, and increase uh, philanthropy. So that is a little bit about um, the, the, the platform that we were, we're running. Um, what I also wanted to do is to take a few minutes to tell you about how we are trying to inspire and grow generosity. Um, I don't know if you've known this, but but the percentage of, of GDP that people give has been stuck uh, every year at about 2% of GDP. Um, and so we were trying to figure out how do, can you help align your values towards giving with your investment um, uh, methodology, solutions, and criteria. So as Ariella mentioned, we actually created something called the Uncommon Generosity 50 Index. What we do is we measure of all the companies in the S&P 500, and we rank the, the 50 most generous companies. So we assign a score to every company. Now, for our definition of generosity, it is not just how much money do you give? Yes, if you write a check for $10 million and you're a company, that's generous. But there are other ways that um, you can make a difference if you're a corporation. One of them is, um, do you have an employee match program? Do you allow as a payroll deduction uh, your employees to give to their favorite nonprofits? And then do you provide a match? Uh, are you a company that may not give cash, but do you give services? So if you're Pfizer or Moderna, and you donate millions and millions of vaccines to a third world country, well, we consider that generous. And then there are also criteria in there about, um, do you, for example, allow your employees to take paid time off to volunteer in their local communities? So being generous, um, obviously giving and giving big does help your score, but there are many other ways that we help determine if a company is generous. We are going to be launching an ETF on the New York Stock Exchange based on the Generosity 50 Index, enabling investors, foundations, endowments 
um, to try to push uh, corporate generosity into a much more important place. And we hope that someday um, that CEOs or board members are asking their employees, their staff, their executive team, why are we not in the top 50? Why are we not in the top 10? How do we become number one? Because I think what we saw first coming out of uh, COVID and the vast amount of need, now what's going on in Ukraine with the solution, uh, with, the, with the problems associated with the war, with refugees, we've seen many nonprofits providing help, is that the need for generosity is as important today as it ever was. We have been stuck historically at about 2% of GDP for giving, and we need to move the needle. And it's very important to make sure that uh, millennials and Gen Z are engaged and they're making a difference in our local community. So I know we had uh, short on time. I wanna give you guys a brief introduction to some of the things we're seeing and what we're trying to do to uh, spur generosity. Um, if anyone is, is interested, please feel free if you have your favorite nonprofit that will help promote them on our platform um, and we'll do whatever we can. And if there's any information I can provide you, great. Um, I don't know if we have another minute, I could take questions, um, but thank you all for listening. Thank you for what you do for the local communities, for giving and making a difference. Appreciate it. Eric, thank you. Thank you so much. That's a fascinating presentation. And as a millennial slash Gen Zer myself, I think I'm right on the boundary being born in 94. It's interesting to learn what, uh, what my generation's trends, uh, trends are like. And uh, hopefully my generation will continue to be generous into the future, helped by your work. Rabbi, we're just to say we're running a little behind time, so no time for questions, but I'm sure Eric will be happy to answer any questions uh, in the chat or leave his contact information if, uh, if, you, if you'd like to ask him anything. Rabbi Abadi, over to you. Yeah, hi, Jake. Thank you very much. And thank you, Eric, for your presentation. It certainly uh, will be very helpful uh, for us, I guess, as we try to raise uh, money to support our endeavors also. Thank you very much. Um, I'm sure we all have heard about uh, the pseudoscience called numerology, where numbers have meanings uh, and some people ascribe to, the, to them certain uh, powers and things like that. Uh, sometimes, of course, uh, the Kabbalah, the mystical uh, aspect of Judaism, uh, includes sometimes certain uh, numbers and numerologies. Um, uh, but of course, um, I take that more as a, uh, as a pseudoscience of entertaining or entertainment with some interesting uh, calculations, uh, that, that's all. However, we do know that in Judaism, we have certain numbers that have uh, certainly uh, importance, if not important, significance more than anything else. And of course, we know the number 40, you know, 40 days, 40 years, uh, but there are other numbers, of course, number one, number three, but number seven is one of those very important numbers in Judaism. Uh, we are actually in a period now of what's known as Sefirat HaOmer, the counting of the Omer, which is a seven weeks, uh, which is a counting of seven times over seven days up to 49 days. Um, and of course, uh, the number seven is very important because that's the seven days of the creation of the world. Even though the creation took, uh, took place only in six days, but of course the seventh days, the Sabbath is included in that seven days. So they're really called the seven days of creation. Perashat um, the Shabbat, Perashat Behar speaks about another uh, counting of seven. And that is, it speaks about the Shemitah, which is a seven year cycle, agricultural cycle in Israel, where the seventh year is a year of rest. And then it also speaks about the Yovel or the Jubilee, which is the year after seven cycles of seven years. After 49 years, the 50th year is known as the Jubilee year, as the Yovel. And of course that has a great significance, not only for for the land of Israel, but also for uh, indentured servants and few other 
a few other issues of property and um, and tribal uh, tribal land ownership uh, land ownership. And so, what's so important about again the number seven or the seven times seven? Well, first of all, we have to learn that indeed God created the world in seven days, um, and uh, on this in six days and the seventh day, seventh day He, so to speak, rested, and from then on we basically have what we know today as the week. The week begins on Sunday as the first day in Hebrew is called Yom Rishon, even in Arabic is called Yom Al Had, which is one. Uh, the first day, and therefore the seventh day is Shabbat. And that is something that no culture, no civilization, no religion, no, uh, no nobody is able kind of to change that. The week is the week since the creation of the world, and that's what we have today. We can uh, invent calendars, we can create months, we can uh, establish uh, uh, you know, years and things like that, but we cannot change the week. And that is a total testimony of the creation of the world by the Almighty with the seventh day being the Sabbath of resting. Likewise, God created, in a sense, this uh, concept of Shemitah, the seventh year, and also of the Yovel, the Jubilee year, is exactly that, that even the land needs a rest. And uh, without rest, even the land is unable to produce. And so, in a sense, uh, Judaism or the Torah is quite green, if I may use that term. Uh, we are quite green because the Torah and Judaism cares very much about the environment, about earth, about nature, and about preserving the beautiful, beautiful world that God has given to us and has created for us. Indeed, the Midrash says, and our sages say that why is it that humanity was created last? Even the smallest bug was created before Adam and Eve. And it is to tell us that the entire world was created for humanity, for humanity to take care of the world, to protect the world, to make sure that the world is not destroyed, not only physically, but of course, socially too. And I think the message of the parasha of this week is understanding the importance, first, of the existence of the Almighty who created the week, who created the world, who created earth, and therefore he created the nature on earth, and it's incumbent upon us to respect that beautiful creation that God has given us. Shabbat Shalom, and may we always be able to bequeath the next generation is a beautiful world that God has given us. Shabbat Shalom. Amen. Shabbat Shalom. Thank you, Rabbi Abadi. Now we turn to reading from the parasha, and Alex is going to read the Hebrew, followed by Mickey reading the English translation for us. שנת שבתון יהיה לארץ והייתה שבת ארץ לכם לאוכלה לך ולעבדך ולמתך ולסירך ולתושבך גרים עמך ולבי בהם תך ולחיה אשר בארצך תהיה כל תבואתה לאכול וספרת לך שבע שבתות שנים שבע שנים שבע פעמים והיו לך הימי שבע שבתות השנים תשע וארבעים שנה ועברת שופר תרועה בחודש השביעי בסל החודש ביום הכיבורים תעבירו שופר בכל ארצכם וקידשתם את שנת החמישים שנה וקראתם דרור בארץ וכל יושבי היובל היא תהיה לכם ושבתם איש אל אחוזתו ואיש אל משפחתו תשובו יובל היא שנת החמישים שנה תהיה לכם לא תזרעו ולא תקצרו את ספיחיה ולא תבזכו את אזוריה כי יובל היא קודש תהיה לכם מן השדה תאכלו את תבואתו 
בשנת היובל הזאת תשובו איש אל אחוזתו. השם spoke to Moses on Mount Sinai. Speak to the Israelite people and say to them, when you, uh, when you enter the land that I assign to you, the land shall observe a Shabbat of Hashem. Six years you may sow your fields, and six years you may prune your vineyard and gather in the yield. But in the seventh year, the land shall have a Sabbath of complete rest, a Sabbath of Hashem, You shall not sow your field or prune your vineyard. You shall not reap the aftergrowth of your harvest or gather the grapes of your untrimmed vines. It shall be a year of complete rest for the land. But you may eat whatever the land during its Sabbath will produce. You, your male and female slaves, the hired and bound laborers who live with you and your cattle and the beasts in your land may eat all its yield. You shall count off seven weeks of years, seven times seven years, so that the period of seven weeks of years gives you a total of 49 years. Then you shall sound the horn loud in the seventh month on the 10th day of the month, the day of atonement, you shall have the horn sounded throughout your land and you shall hallow the 50th year You shall proclaim release throughout the land for all its inhabitants. It shall be a jubilee for you. Each of you shall return to your holding and each of you shall return to your family. That 50th year shall be a jubilee for you. You shall not sow, neither shall you reap the aftergrowth or harvest the untrimmed vines for it is a jubilee. It shall be holy to you. You may eat only the growth direct from the field. In this year of Jubilee, each of you shall return to your holdings. Alex, Mickey, thank you so much. Now to Jean with the prayer for peace. Thank you, Jake. And I wanted to mention a couple of things. This week we had another uh, momentous um, gathering uh, that we've been allowed to do since the Abraham Accords. And that we had a memorial tribute to Sheikh Khalifa bin Zayed al Nahyan. And uh, members from all sides of the community came, and it was um, a really meaningful gathering. A lot of you were there, I know. Um, and I also wanted to mention uh, that um, we have a couple of memorial tributes uh, within our community uh, after we recently lost a community member, Michael Citrone. And uh, we actually have uh, both his mom on the call, Brina Doris Black. I want to mention. I wanted to mention you and also welcome you to the call. And also his wife, Angeli Passis is on the call, our community member. So we welcome both of you. There are a couple of memorial tributes to Michael this weekend. And if anyone needs further information, they can reach out to me or to Angeli or to Rick, who's also on the call. And now it's my honor to read the prayer for peace. And this is adapted from Rabbi Nachman ben Fega, Lord of peace, divine ruler to whom peace belongs, master of peace, creator of all things. May it be your will to put an end to war and bloodshed on earth and to spread a great and wonderful peace over the whole world. Help us and save us all and let us cling tightly to the virtue of peace. Let there be a truly great peace between every person and their fellow and let there be no discord between people even in their hearts. Let us never shame any person on earth, great or small. May it be granted unto us to fulfill thy commandment to love thy neighbor as thyself with all our hearts and souls and bodies and possessions. God, who is peace, bless us with peace. And uh, once again, we send our condolences to Brina and to Angeli and uh, lots of love to both of you. Thank you. Thank you, Jean. And yes, I'd like to echo that message. Angeli, Brina, the whole community uh, shares in your, in your grief and in memory of, of Michael, who is an amazing, I didn't have the pleasure of knowing him for so long, but he was just an amazing, amazing guy. And as Rick says in the chat, um, there's going to be a Zoom Kaddish for Michael right after this call. And um, the link is there. Rick has just posted it if anyone on this call would like to join that commemoration. Rabbi Esti is now going to read the prayer for the GCC countries.
May he who gives salvation to kings and dominions to princes, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, who delivers his servant David from the evil sword, who makes a way in the sea and a path through mighty waters, bless and protect, guard and help, exalt, magnify, and uplift, his majesty, the king of Saudi Arabia, his majesty, the king of Bahrain, his majesty, the Sultan of Oman, his Highness, the President of the UAE, His Highness, the Emir of Kuwait, and His Highness, the Emir of Qatar, and all their crown princes. And may the Supreme, Supreme King of Kings in His mercy put a spirit of wisdom and understanding into their hearts and the hearts of all their counselors and officials to deal kindly with us, the House of Jacob, and all the people of this land. Be their shelter and stronghold and let them not falter. In their days and in ours, may these lands be blessed with stability, prosperity, and peace. May this be his will and let us say amen. Amen. Thank you, Rabboni Esti. Okay. Isaac, with Shalom Aleichem to close the call. Shalom Aleichem, Malachi Hasharet, Malachi Elion. Mi melech malachi amlachi makadosh baruchu Boachim le shalom malachi ashalom malachi elion Mi melech malachi amlachi makadosh baruchu Barkuni le shalom malachi ashalom malachi elion Mi melech malachi amlachi makadosh baruchu Beshiftechem le shalom malachi ashalom malachi elion Mi melech malachi amlachi makadosh baruchu Besetchem le shalom malachi ashalom malachi elion Mi melech malachi amlachim hakadosh baruchu. Shabbat shalom. Thank you, Isaac. Shabbat shalom, everyone. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom, everybody. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom, everybody. Everybody. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Bye. Shabbat shalom.